Hey Nathano, this is Devotionables, Brief Devotions for Busy People. I'm Caleb Shaw. I serve as a deacon here at Nathano and as director of the YC3 BFG. Today we are going to be in Isaiah chapter 5. As a reminder, Isaiah is prophesying in the latter half of the kingdom period in Israel's history, and he's prophesying primarily to the kingdom of Judah. I want us to zoom in on the beginning of chapter 5 this morning, uh, specifically the first seven verses in this devotional. These verses are called the Vineyard Song, and this song teaches us so much about God's love and care for his people Israel, and then why judgment on the nation uh, ended up being deserved. So let's read these seven verses uh, real quick together. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. In the first few verses, Isaiah begins by describing the Lord's care and love for this vineyard. He picked a fertile hill. He prepared the land. He planted a choice vine. He built a watchtower to protect it. He did everything he could to ensure that this vineyard would be fruitful. Now, Ruthie and I have been getting into gardening just a little bit this year. Where it's our first taste of it. And even though we only have two 4x4 four four raised beds, we've put quite a bit of care and work into it. We've tried to get the right mix of soil, the right fertilizer, healthy plants. We even put in a drip irrigation line to try to combat all this crazy heat we've had the last few weeks. We've done as much as we could do to make sure that our little garden produces good fruit and we reap a harvest. And you know what? I would be a little frustrated if after all this work we've done, this little garden never produced anything despite all the work we've put in. But if I could get frustrated at a few unfruitful tomato plants, just think about the Lord's righteous and just anger towards his unfruitful people. Remember that the Lord has put them in the land flowing with milk and honey. He's given them his word. He's sent prophets. He's given them judges and kings to defeat their enemies. He's done all this, which is why he can rightfully ask in verse 4, what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? He's done it all. And yet, instead of yielding good grapes, it yielded wild grapes, which basically just means rotten or good-for-nothing grapes. So the wasted vineyard receives the just judgment of the Lord. He removes protection from it. He stops caring for it. He makes it a waste and ordains a drought to come upon it. And then what has been understood in the passage, what's underneath the surface, becomes explicit at the end in verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Israel was meant to be a fruitful vineyard, and Judah especially was to be the choicest vine in the vineyard. Yet when the Lord looked to them for fruit, he looked for the fruit of justice in the vineyard, he only found bloodshed. When he looked for the fruit of righteousness, he only found an outcry. How sad. What a waste of the Lord's rich blessings on them and on their fathers for generations. I think the application of this passage for us today is not to waste the good work that the Lord is doing in us, in our families, and in our church. The Lord 
is at work in us individually and in us corporately. He wants us to be people who bear good fruit. We are in an even more privileged position than Israel was in the time that Isaiah is prophesying this. We have a high priest who was greater than Aaron, who is always interceding for us. We have a prophet who is greater than Isaiah, who not only spoke the words of God, but is the word of God himself. We have a king greater than David, who will sit on David's throne forever and ever. We've heard the gospel. The Lord has graciously given us faith to repent and believe. We've been adopted into his family. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We are members of a healthy, thriving church here at Ninth and O. The Lord has truly given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, as Ephesians 1 says. So let's not waste it. Let's be a people who produce fruit. Let's leave no doubt that the Lord is at work within us. Let's abide in Jesus Christ, the true vine, because we can't produce any fruit without him. Let's pray that we individually and as a church would be those kind of people who produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives so that when the Lord returns, he finds a healthy vineyard full of good fruit. Thanks for watching today. Go and produce fruit that glorifies our Lord.